ultimately, we um, feel that we have enough talent in Southern California to cover all the topics from between all the academic centers and et cetera, et cetera, that we have a number of national and internationally known people, so we don't have to go outside of Southern California. But in this occasion, for this speaker, we felt it was important to ask Florence Wong to give this talk. Um, as Telfer Reynolds was, as you know, a specialist in portal hypertension, many of you may not know, Florence, you may not even know that Telfer was, treated, was trained originally as a nephrologist. There was no hepatology training. And then he trained with Sheila Sherlock. But um, if you trained with him, you had to go through the pathophys of renal pathophys day in, day out, over and over again. So um, anyway, most of you know Florence is nationally known. She's from the University of Toronto, and she flew in last night and got stuck in the airport because of COVID. And, we're, and she has uh, written the Sentinel paper on renal syndrome <clears throat> that was published in the England Journal of Medicine, and we've asked her to speak for us today. So Florence, thank you very much for coming. Good morning, everybody. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me and for the warm introduction by Dr. Pockris. So I was actually a guest at Dr. Reynolds' Holiday House in the year 1990. And I was introduced to this medical giant in the field of renal and electrolyte physiology in patients with cirrhosis. He was so nice, such a generous mentor, and he was a host to many young hepatologists. But I must say that Mrs. Reynolds herself was equally, if not more generous, and made sure that we were fed. And I actually got lost going to his home. We arrived three hours late, in those days, we had no cell phone. I had a big map, and I kept pushed off the um, LA highways. I was living in Australia, driving on the wrong side of the road. And she was so worried, and after that time, she made sure that I would not get lost in the big city of LA. So these are my disclosures. The name Haparorino syndrome was coined in 1970, but it was not defined until 1996 after the formation of the International Ascites Club. And in the ensuing 10 years, because of further understanding of the pathophysiology of Haparorino syndrome, it was redefined in 2007. And in 2011, we adopted the term acute kidney injury to describe renal dysfunction in cirrhosis. And two years ago, a new condition or a variation of acute kidney injury known as acute kidney disease was proposed for the cirrhotic population. So what exactly is hepatorenal syndrome? It's described as a potentially reversible syndrome that occurs in patients with cirrhosis, ascites, and liver failure, consisting of impaired renal function, marked abnormalities in cardiovascular function, and intense overactivity of the endogenous vasoactive systems. So that's the description of the condition, but how do we define it? It occurs in patients with cirrhosis who's got a rapidly increasing serum creatinine to more than 2.5 milligram per deciliter in less than two weeks, and you have to exclude a pre-renal renal failure as well as structural renal diseases. But the challenge is, can we diagnose hepatorenal syndrome type one or the acute type in patients who have an acute increase but not doubling of the serum creatinine within the two week period. And so the answer is yes, 
Uh, this is related to the fact that the concept of renal dysfunction has been evolving over the years. I mentioned the term acute kidney injury, which was first described by an organization known as um, ACI. And ACI is made up of nephrologists and intensive care physicians whom then uh, allow us to borrow the term acute kidney injury to describe renal dysfunction in patients with cirrhosis. And in 2015, the International Ascites Club formally de uh, defined acute kidney injury for the cirrhotic patient. So what is acute kidney injury? It's an acute increase in serum creatinine of more than 0.3 milligram per deciliter in less than 40 hours. It has been shown in multiple populations that even such small increases in serum creatinine could have a negative impact on the outcome of these patients. Now you tell me that not every patient will have a serum creatinine that is done within the 48 hours. And if that's the case, you can use a stable serum creatinine in the last three months, presumably that the increase in the serum creatinine that you're looking at has occurred in the last seven days. And so the definition of AKI is an increase in the serum creatinine by 0.3 milligram per deciliter in less than 48 hours or an increase of 50% from baseline, and the severity of the AKI is described by stages. Stage one is either this 0.3 milligram per deciliter or 50% to doubling from the baseline, stage two is doubling to troubling, and stage three is more than troubling. And so now hepatorenal syndrome type one is renamed HRS AKI, and the diagnostic criteria have remained virtually the same, except now we have removed the fixed threshold of serum creatinine for diagnosis, but just take doubling or trebling of serum creatinine while keeping all the other diagnostic criteria. I promise you this is the only pathophysiology slide. Since this is a Telfer Reynolds lecture, I have to talk about pathophysiology. So this is the cirrhotic liver with distortion of liver architecture, and therefore there's obstruction to portal flow, leading to the development of portal hypertension. It has two consequences. Firstly, increased translocation of gut bacteria and bacterial products across the gut wall into the splanchnic circulation, and many of these bacterial products have vasodilatory properties and therefore leading to splanchnic vasodilatation. The presence of portal hypertension will also increase shear stress to splanchnic vessels, leading to the production of vasodilators. The end result is that the splanchnic circulation is, uh, the capacitance is much larger than non cirrhotic patient. And you tell me, so what? So for you and I who don't have liver disease, we have a total circulatory capacitance of say seven liters. And we have seven liters of volume within it, but in the cirrhotic patient because of the vasodilatation, they will have a capacitance of say 10 liters. And therefore without losing any intravascular volume, the body senses that there isn't sufficient volume within the circulation. And that state is known as a reduction in the effective arterial blood volume. And that will lead to a series of physiological responses such as activation of various vasoconstrictor systems. Unfortunately, the renal circulation is particularly sensitive to the vasoconstrictive effects of these various vasoconstrictors. And therefore, the kidneys in patients with portal hypertension are poised to develop further renal vasoconstriction. constriction. And if the patient happens to have alcoholic hepatitis or a flare of the viral hepatitis or drug-induced liver injury, you will have a necrotic hepatocyte, which will produce what we call damage-associated molecular pattern, 
And these together with the bacterial products will activate the innate immune system, causing an inflammatory response leading to increased production of cytokines and chemokines as well as increased production of vasodilators, worsening the reduction in the effective arterial blood volume. These chemokines and cytokines can cause microthrombi within the renal microcirculation, contributing to the propensity for the development of renal failure. And so how do we manage a patient with her pararenal syndrome? First of all, you need to resuscitate, screen for infection, and treat any precipitating factor. Patients can develop her pararenal syndrome without the presence of infection, and also exclude structural causes of the AKI. And so this is to go in the ASLD guideline for acute on chronic liver failure, and I've borrowed it from there. So this is a patient who's developed renal failure. First of all, you need to determine the renal failure phenotype. Is it structural renal disease, or is the patient dehydrated, or has the patient truly got HRS, AKI? If that patient happens to have other organ failures, then you need to treat each individual organ failure separately. So for patients who have got pre-renal acetemia or HRS, the first thing is you need to remove your precipitating factor, be it overuse of diuretics or the presence of nephrotoxic drugs. If you have a known source of infection, treat it. And if the patient has lost excess blood due to GI bleed, then you need to give the patient a blood transfusion. If the patient does not need a blood transfusion, then you give volume expansion with albumin, one gram per kilogram of body weight to a maximum of 100 grams per day, and you closely monitor the patient with daily blood work. And you need to act early. This is a study from the North American Consortium for the study of end-stage liver disease, showing you that in patients who's got a baseline serum creatinine of more than 1.5 milligram per deciliter, which is now extremely common amongst patients with diabetes, significantly less of them will have a transient cause of the AKI, but more of them will have a persistent cause, that is the kidney function does not improve or they can progress, and therefore, act early, especially if the patient has got a high baseline serum creatinine. This is because the longer you wait, the more likely you are going to develop um, renal tubular damage. And so once you've started giving patient albumin, then the next question you have to ask yourself, is the patient responding with a reduction in the serum creatinine, and if so, close monitoring. If the patient's not responding, or if the serum creatinine is increasing, and then you have to decide, is the patient fulfilling the diagnostic criteria for HRS, AKI, and if so, treat with vasoconstrictor and albumin. And then you watch and decide whether the patient is responding. If so, well and good, close monitoring. If no, then you need to initiate renal replacement therapy and initiate assessment for liver transplantation. Now, I'm just going to say a brief word about the use of albumin. This is our cirrhotic patient with ascites. That's the compensator with the increase in vascular capacitance without the loss of um, intravascular volume, and you're using albumin just to refill the expanded uh, intravascular capacitance. But then, in, in addition, albumin has a lot of other non-volume expanding properties, including immune modulation, endothelial stabilization, reduction in the capillary permeability, which is very important in reducing the amount of uh, bacteria and bacterial products going across the gut wall, and therefore it will have beneficial effects along the cascade of pathophysiological processes that ultimately will lead to renal hypoperfusion. So what vasoconstrictor should we use? Well, why terlipressin is the most widely used vasoconstrictor, followed by norepinephrine, 
and are followed by Midodrianoctritae. And I know that in North America, we do not yet have Terlipresin available, and most people are still using Midodrianoctritae, and hopefully the scenario will change in the new year. To date, there are four randomized controlled trials assessing the use of Terlipresin for the treatment of hepatorenal syndrome. And you can see that one's from Spain. In fact, that one included both HRS1 and HRS2 patients, and three from North America. And of the four studies, Terlipresin was better than placebo in terms of reversing hepatorenal syndrome. However, only three of the four studies show a significant difference. And Terlipresin in all of those studies was given uh, in an intermittent regimen given one gram six hourly, and if the patient is not responding by day four, can increase it to two milligrams six hourly, and the recommendation is to stop when a serum creatinine falls below 1.5 milligram per deciliter, or at maximum 14 days of treatment. And if the patient is not responding at all, then you can stop on day four. And so I'm just going to talk about the latest uh, randomized control trial using terlipresin versus placebo that was published in New England Journal earlier this year. And you can see that patients who were given terlipresin, one milligram uh, IV six hourly compared to placebo was able to reduce the number of patients at the end of treatment still having renal failure. The same was not observed in patients with placebo. But what was unexpected was that at the end of treatment, they found that a significantly higher number of patients had respiratory failure, whereas that was not observed in patients who received placebo. And so the search then went on as to what's caused that when they broke down patients, uh, according to the severity of their uh, overall condition by breaking them into various grades of acute on chronic liver failure. They found that uh, in patients with grade one to two uh, ACLF, the ability of terlipresin to reverse the hepatorenal syndrome was much better in patients with lower grades of ACLF, whereas in grade three, they were unable to reduce the, uh, uh, the to reverse the hepatorenal syndrome. And what they also observed was that most of the cases of respiratory failure actually occurred in patients with grade three ACLF, that is patients with at least three organ failure, it occurred in 30% of these patients, whereas it did not occur in any of the patients who received placebo. And so a further assessment of these patients show that parameters of liver function, hemodynamics, and respiratory functions were predictors of the development of respiratory failure. So patients who's got a high INR were more likely to develop respiratory failure. Patients with a high mean arterial pressure were also more likely to develop respiratory failure. And patients with a lower pulse oximeter oxygen saturation at baseline um, at less than 90 were also more likely to develop respiratory failure. And when they assess the patients further, you will see that in patients who had grades one to two ACLF, the survival at 90 days from the beginning of study was no difference between patients who received terlipresin and patients who received placebo. However, in patients who had grade three ACLF, that is patients with three organ failure, those patients who received terlipresin actually had a significantly worse survival compared to patients who received placebo. And this difference is statistically significant. So now let's 
look at uh, bolus versus continuous infusion when I was doing the Turley present study. Uh, because it was an, an approved drug, the ward nurses would not give Turley present, and therefore we had to uh, get an MD to go in six hourly around the clock to give the Turley present, and it was very inconvenient. So the Italians uh, decided to use a continuous infusion of Turley present. And what they found was that in patients who received a continuous infusion, they were able to use a significantly lower total daily dose of uh, Turley present without compromising uh, the outcome. This is in terms of the number of hospital stays and also without compromising the survival rate. And what is more important is that in those patients who responded, whether they were using a continuous infusion or a bolus injections, the responders did significantly better compared to the non-responders. The responders were the ones who were able to reduce the serum creatinine down to less than 1.5 milligram per deciliter. Now, in North America, we only have middle drain octreti until now. And this is a study conducted in Europe showing you that uh, compared to middle drain octreti, terlipresin was able to improve renal function significantly better than middle drain octreti, and also to reverse hepatorenal syndrome compared to middle drain octreti. And you, as you can see, only a small fraction of patients responded to middle drain octreti by reversing the hepatorenal syndrome. What about norepinephrine? That's the other vasoconstrictor. And so far, there have only been few very small head-to-head -head comparisons between terlipresin and norepinephrine for hepatorenal syndrome type 1. And I have put one here uh, conducted in India showing you that terlipresin and norepinephrine were equally efficacious in terms of reducing the serum creatinine and improving the urine output. And I have shown you here a meta-analysis comparing four studies which compare these two drugs head-to-head, -head showing once again that norepinephrine or noradrenaline is equally efficacious as terlipresin in terms of uh, improving the renal function in patients with type 1 hepatorenal syndrome. Now, because norepinephrine is a vasoconstrictor, and in most countries you need to administer it in an intensive intensive care setting, and this is a study that's come out from San Francisco, San Francisco showing you that perhaps you can use norepinephrine under a monitor condition in the ward. And this is a study comparing norepinephrine for midodrin and non-responders. So these were the patients who had already received midodrin and, and octreti. They were not responding. They were therefore given norepinephrine. And you can see that there are basically th three possible outcomes. Either you continue to not respond or you respond to the use of norepinephrine or you can have a partial response. What they did was they had a step down type of setting with cardiac monitoring outside the intensive care unit with a low patient to nursing ratio of three to one. And they also started using a low dose of norepinephrine, five micrograms per minute to start, and maximum rising to 10, sorry, five micrograms per minute, rising to a maximum dose of 10 micrograms per minute. They observed arrhythmia in a quarter of the patients, otherwise ischemic adverse events were very rare. So this was the first study that has shown that norepinephrine could potentially be used in a monitor setting, such as a step-down unit outside the intensive care, and therefore this should pave the way for increased access to intravenous vasoconstrictors for patients with hepatorenal syndrome. 
Now, tolipressin has been compared to norepinephrine in patients with acute and chronic liver failure, study that's come from uh, India. However, the definition of ACLF in this particular study follow the Asian Pacific uh, Society for the Study of Liver Disease, and they defined it as a combination of a bilirubin of more than five milligram per deciliter and INR of more than 1.5, plus the appearance of ascites with or without hepatic encephalopathy within four weeks. What they show was that in patients with these parameters, terlipressin was significantly better than norepinephrine in terms of reversing the hepatorenal syndrome, observed as early as day four and persisted till day 14. And in addition, the overall survival of the patients who received terlipressin was significantly better than the patients who received norepinephrine. And remembering that ACLF in Europe and in North America are defined by a much, a much more stringent set of criteria. And so I've briefly mentioned response to vasoconstrictor therapy, and response is defined as either none, partial, or complete. Complete response is a reduction of the serum creatinine to less than 0.3 milligram per deciliter from baseline, Partial, it's a reduction in the serum creatinine to a value of more than 0.5 milligram per deciliter above the baseline, and no response is no regression of the AKI. And the uh, regression is defined as a regression of the AKI to a lower stage, perhaps from stage three to stage two, or stage two to stage one, and progression is the progression of the AKI to a higher degree or the need for renal replacement therapy. So this is just to show you that progression of AKI has a significantly negative impact on the prognosis. This is a study uh, headed, it's, it's um, multi-center multi US study headed by Yale, showing you that no matter what the initial stage of the AKI is, if you have progression or if there is a need for a dialysis, there is a progressive increase in the overall mortality. So whether you start off with stage one or stage two or stage three, and you can see that if you have uh, started off with stage three AKI and if you progress to dialysis, 70% of these patients will die. Conversely, if you with your treatment can reduce the stage of the AKI, there is a significantly improved survival with or without liver transplant, once again showing you that in patients with stage three, improving to either stage two, one, or zero, there is a significantly increased survival no matter what your start of AKI stage is. And now you don't really need complete reversal of the AKI in order to improve the survival. Uh, this study was done by uh, the late Dr. Boyer showing that all you need is a 20% reduction in the serum creatinine with treatment and it is associated with a significantly improved survival. And this is a meta-analysis grouping seven studies together showing you that if you can drop the serum creatinine even by 0.5 and there is a 20% chance of survival, improvement in survival. And of course, the more reduction in your serum creatinine, the better is the overall survival. So every attempt should be made to treat these patients and try to lower the serum creatinine. Now, I just want to mention uh, briefly about the use of renal replacement therapy, generally not recommended unless patient is on the liver transplant waiting list. It is a very controversial subject that I really do not want to get into. Uh, it tends to prolong hospitalization and these patients do not do well. 
It may be considered in certain scenarios, such as if the patient comes in with alcoholic hepatitis and you know that uh, there is a reversible possibility of the alcoholic hepatitis, then you may tie the patient over uh, while the patient recovers uh, from the alcoholic hepatitis. And there is some data to show that in patients who have got multi-organ failure, by improving the renal function, you may give the other organs a better chance for improvement. So this is a retrospective study uh, published a few years ago showing that in patients who has got uh, HRS, for those who were not listed for liver transplant, uh, even if you're on RT, only a small percentage of patients remain alive. And if you are listed for liver transplant, um, the overall um, survival rate is minimal without a transplant. And and if you do not have liver transplant, the overall survival of patients with stage three AKI using data from the transplant unit at Toronto General Hospital, and you can see that over the course of 12 months, um, this is stage three AKI, not HRS. Uh, it's approximately 50% in a year. Briefly, for uh, liver transplant for patients with HRS, all patients with refractory ascites should be referred for liver transplant assessment. This is because liver transplantation will eliminate portal hypertension, liver dysfunction, and hemodynamic abnormalities. The ascites may take a little while to disappear. This is because the abnormal hemodynamics tend to persist for weeks to months, and therefore these patients may require short-term dialysis. And this is data from the transplant unit at Toronto General Hospital showing you uh, that the higher the uh, serum creatinine at the onset of the HRS, the more likely is the patient not to reverse the HRS with transplant, and also the longer the pre-transplant uh, dialysis duration, the more likely the patient is not to uh, reverse the HRS post-transplant. And also patients who do not reverse the HRS with, pro with transplant have a significantly worse survival. And what about simultaneous kidney liver transplant? I do not usually do liver transplant, and I believe that uh, uh, there are guidelines uh, guiding the transplant units, but this is basically uh, what has come out. And patients who's got concomitant chronic kidney disease, stage 3B, or if there's more than 30% fibrosis or glomerulosclerosis, it's recommended that such patients should receive a simultaneous kidney and liver transplant in patients who have got prolonged AKI or prolonged dialysis time and the limit is country or region dependent, these patients should also receive a simultaneous liver and kidney transplant. However, for all other patients, it should be done with a liver transplant alone. However, there's a safety net uh, after the liver transplant, patients may be considered for an early kidney transplant if there's been no recovery or renal function, dialysis of more than three months, or the patient should have had a simultaneous kidney transplant with a liver transplant, but deferred due to high risk for kidney transplantation at the time of liver transplantation. Just a word or two about prevention of HRS in patients who have developed resistance or intolerance to diuretics. You need to withdraw the diuretics and you need to use albumin judiciously, especially with large volume paracentesis of more than five liters. And please start antibiotic empirically early in patients who are suspected of having infection, in patients who have got uh, Proven spontaneous bacterial peritonitis albumin is recommended in conjunction with antibiotics in patients who has got acute GI bleed, 
antibiotics should be given together with other resuscitation measures, avoid nephrotoxic drugs, and sets or radiographic dyes, especially in patients who have got established baseline renal dysfunction. A couple of words about the future. We now know that the earlier you diagnose your AKI and start treatment, the better will be the outcome. So we need biomarkers to help us to detect AKI early. We also need better diagnostic tools in the differentiation of the various phenotypes of AKI. We also need improved protocols of vasoconstrictor therapy. For example, the continuous infusion of vasopressin is preferred over the um, bolus injections. We also need refinement of indicators of likely response to vasoconstrictor therapy. What about the development of combination therapy? And I'm just going to show you some data in the next slide or two. We need predictors of prognosis and also improve dual organ allocation. So these are some of the biomarkers that have been studied and unfortunately none of them is yet available for um, commercial use. Perhaps, uh, I'm not sure in the US whether ANGEL is available, but that, has, that is the one that is most widely studied and there are thresholds to tell you whether the patient has got, is, is likely to have tubular injury or functional renal failure. And this is just an this is just to show you that the use of biomarkers, so these are the various cutoff of the urinary angle showing you in conjunction is the, with the MEL score, the likelihood of the patient to die without, uh, the, uh, without liver transplantation. So the higher the MEL score, the lower the threshold for urinary angle to predict mortality. Uh, now, I talked about combination therapy, and one such drug is serolaxin. Um, it's actually a relaxin, at first described in patients who are pregnant, and serolaxin has now been studied in patients in, with cirrhosis, showing you that it can actually improve renal arterial flow. Now, tolipressin, it's actually has got no effect on the renal circulation whatsoever. The reason why it works is because it is a splenic vasoconstrictor. It squeezes the blood from the splenic circulation into the systemic circulation, thereby improving the renal perfusion pressure, whereas relaxin works specifically at the renal artery, improving renal blood flow and decreasing renal vascular resistance. And so what about combining tolipressin together with serolaxin? So here you will have a drug that squeezes the blood out of this blank circulation, while at the same time, another drug that opens up the renal circulation to receive the extra blood that's coming back from the splenic circulation possibility and we will need to wait for the pharmaceutical company to see whether they will think of such a combination. And so to sum up, uh, renal failure is the most common organ failure in patients with decompensated cirrhosis. You need to organize, you need to recognize it early in order to initiate timely treatment. Telepresin is the most commonly used vasoconstrictor worldwide, although it is still not yet available in North America for AKI and cirrhosis. Small improvement in renal function as measured by serum creatinine with treatment is beneficial. Refer for consideration for liver transplant early because early transplantation is associated with improved outcomes. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>